Welcome to Mountain Bible Church this morning. Emmanuel, God is with us. I can't even fathom what that must have been like being a shepherd, spending most of your life out in the fields with stinky animals and feeling pretty lonely and lowly. And then angels appear to tell you you're one of the first ones to know that God is Emmanuel. Well, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Our worship together is, is an offering to God. And so I would encourage you guys, as you think through your worship, as you, as you ponder how you worship the Lord, and remember, our worship is not for us. This is for Him. And so as you sing to Him, dwell on Him, our God who is with us. Well, turn to somebody next to you this morning, shake a hand, and tell them, welcome to Mountain Bible Church.
Well, hey, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's so good to see all of you here. So many happy, bright faces this morning on this very cold and chilly morning. It just warms my heart to see all of you here this morning. Uh, welcome to Mountain Bible Church. My name is Daniel Newberry. I am the youth pastor here at Mountain Bible. And we have like five announcements to go through. And it's just, I'm exhausted already just looking at it. So let's just try to get through these as fast as we can. First of all, if you're a first time, second time, third time visitor, we want to get to know you more. And so there are these visitor information cards are in the backs of the chairs in front of you. You can fill those out with any questions you have about the church and then just, just drop them in the offering boxes, which are in the back of the sanctuary. Or you can take them to the visitor center outside where it is freezing cold outside. But you can still take them out there and uh, receive a little visitor's gift as well. Uh, a few announcements. First of all, our Christmas uh, tea is coming up, the ladies' Christmas tea. Yes, we're very excited for that. Um, that's coming up, and on Saturday, December 9th, more information about the tea can be found online on the Women's Ministry page, but we do need servers. And since this is a ladies' tea, guess who serves? Not the ladies. <laughs> the men. So uh, Rich McAllister is looking for volunteers to serve uh, the ladies' tea, and it's a really fun time. Um, I've served it the last couple of years. I got the high school kids involved the last couple of years. Honestly, I have a blast trying to teach high school boys how to wear a button-up shirt um, is kind of fun. <laughs> uh, so if you are a man who wants and is able to serve at the Women's Tea, uh, please contact Rich McAllister. He would love to sign you up as a volunteer. Also, there are still some tickets available uh, online that can be purchased for the Women's Tea. So if you've yet to get your ticket... They've extended the deadline just a little bit uh, so that you can still buy those tickets. So you can go online to mountainbible.org and you can get the tickets on there. Uh, our second announcement, Bright Horizons Widows Luncheon is meeting this Thursday at 11.45 a.m. in the Ramada. Uh, that's a really great group. I'm really excited about that ministry that we have. And if you have questions about that, you can talk to Jed and Susan Morrison, which are sitting right over here in the back, the very friendly people. Um, I mean, that wasn't sarcastic. They're very friendly people. I'm serious. <laughs> um, anyway, so we have our Christmas Eve services coming up. Uh, you can guess when those are, Christmas Eve. Uh, we'll be meeting for an hour-long service at our regular times, 845 and 1030. Uh, the kids will be singing and joining parents in the services. Uh, only nursery and preschool care will be available. There will be Christmas goodies and hot cocoa between services. Uh, I mean assuming people make them, we do need people to make goodies. So if you know some Christmas recipes that you want to share between services, uh, let us know. We'd be happy to have you uh, share those. And if you're interested, we also need people to sign up for Kids Town to help with the preschool and the nursery during Christmas Eve. We're almost done, guys. There's two more. Here we go. Um, we also desperately need greeters and ushers. Uh, for some reason, people just don't like shaking hands. And so if you would like to volunteer your time to shake people's hands as they come in and just be a friendly face, if people have told you, hey, you're a warm, welcoming person, we want to have you out front so that as people get to the church, we can uh, show people how much we want them to be here. So if you want to sign up to be a greeter or an usher, you can contact Eric and Don Lindsay. Uh, they'd be happy to get you signed up. And one last thing, um, we have a new giving uh, and suggested donation policy. Uh, Mountain Bible Church is going to make every reasonable effort to honor designated gifts. However, according to IRS regulations, we all love the IRS, um, according to IRS regulations, for a gift to be considered a tax-deductible gift, the church must maintain full control over how that gift is used. So we follow a suggested donation policy. Uh, please know that this has never been violated. Like, if you guys have given money and said, I would like this to go to this ministry at our very best efforts. We've made sure that it goes to that ministry, but we can't necessarily have a suggested donation. So we follow a, a certain policy, and that's the policy we have on that. So if you have questions about that, uh, you can talk to any of the pastoral staff. Uh, we'd be happy to help answer those questions. So with all of that massive mouthful of words said, <laughs> let's get back to worshiping Jesus, okay? Let me pray for us, and let's worship the Lord. Gracious and Heavenly Father, God, you are so amazing and, and so massive, and you're, you're the creator of everything. 
And so often I think we forget how, how sovereign you are and the fact that you are in control of every part of our lives. And sometimes life gets disorganized, sometimes it gets broken, sometimes it's hurt, sometimes it makes no sense. But you reign over it all. And so I ask that during this time of worship, that you would remind us how you reorganize our lives to be that good creation that you originally designed it to be. How through your son, you bring that perfect gift of salvation. Lord, impact our hearts. Open up our hearts and our minds to receive you and to know you. And as Pastor Billy comes up here to preach this morning, Lord, use his words to pierce our hearts with the gospel message of your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, let's go ahead and stand up and let's worship the Lord together. No way. 
shining in the east, beyond them far and to the earth, it gave great light, and so it continued both day and night. No. Then let us all with one accord sing praises to our heavenly Lord that hath made heaven. Father, thank you. God, this morning as we turn our eyes to you, get our, get our hearts and minds off the season of getting and think about, God, what you have done and what we've received through your amazing love for us. God, we pray for Pastor Billy this morning that your spirit would speak through him in a mighty way. We love you and we trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. You know, I've been singing those songs for 47 years, and every year I think, was that line always there? You'd think I'd have it memorized by now, but I do not. I have a tough time memorizing songs. I don't know what the deal is. Well, hey, we're going to jump right back into the book of Exodus. Pastor Daniel taught us through the parting of the Red Sea last week and God bringing his people miraculously through on dry ground as the waters were heaped up on either side and the way the Lord de- uh, destroyed the Egyptian army. And so this morning we're going to pick up immediately following those events and, and as they're now on their journey from Egypt to the promised land. So we're going to pick up actually in Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. So you can turn there, Exodus 15, verse 22. And we're going to go all the way through the end of, or almost the end of chapter 16 this morning. Exodus 15, 22. The first few verses here, 22 through the first part of 25 say, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. 
Therefore, the name of it was called Mara, which, as you could figure out, means bitter. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And so he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Now, three days in the desert is a long time to be walking without anything to drink. We know that when they left Egypt, they left with livestock, they left with provisions, they, they, they had uh, things to eat. But at this point, they were out of water. And, and so complaining, I, I don't know that I would be too hard on them for, for saying, you know, Moses, we, we don't have anything to drink here. And I, I'm sure Moses had figured that out because he didn't have anything to drink either. But that's a long time. As a matter of fact, they say three days is about as long as you can go without water if you're exerting yourself in any way whatsoever or if you are in hot weather. And so they were in trouble. Have you ever been in that place before of just desperate thirst? Have you ever experienced desperate thirst before? Now, maybe not because you had gone a prolonged period of time without, without something to drink, but I, I remember... In, in uh, I think I believe I was a sophomore, maybe a junior, in high school football practice. Summer practice leading into the season, we were having two a days. We were in full pads at this point in time, and it was 110 degrees. And we were running and running and running. And of course, the coaches said, if, not, if everyone doesn't get back across the line within this amount of time, you're just going to keep going until you guys get it. And so we're going and we're going and we're going. And they're just, the reality was there were a couple of guys that just weren't going to get there in time. And the coach knew that. And we just kept going and going. And I got to the point where I was, I couldn't swallow. My mouth was so dry. My throat, when I would try to swallow, my throat would kind of stick together. And I would start to gag a little bit. I mean, I got to the point where I'm going, I can't go another minute without something to drink. We ran another one. And I'm, I'm, I'm just barely keeping it together. And I remember I'm, I'm on my, I got my hands on my knees like this and I'm trying to catch my breath. And there, I'm looking for some semblance of moisture somewhere. And there was a sprinkler head in the field. And it was, it, there was like a muddy little puddle on top of the sprinkler head. And I, I just about sucked that muddy water off that sprinkler head. I didn't do it, but I was close. And so I understand this, this idea, this, this feeling of just, just feeling like I, I can't go another minute without a drink. That's how they felt. Now remember, this is interesting, because everywhere they went in the wilderness, this, this had already begun. The Lord had already put this in place. Everywhere they went, they were led by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. And so the Lord had led them to this place. They were following that cloud, and that cloud had led them to this place where there was a spring. They weren't just fumbling through the desert. And man, you could imagine, when they saw that spring, they thought, oh, thank you, Lord, this is fantastic. But they, they realized the waters were bitter. Now, that doesn't mean that, that they were poisoned exactly, but, but they were unfit to drink. It wasn't something that was going to satisfy their thirst. It was something that was, that was going to make them sick instead. And I find that interesting. Why would the Lord have led them to that place? Why, the, why would the Lord have led them to a place Knowing they were dying of thirst, they finally find a spring and it's, it's something that they cannot drink. When the Lord cries out to Moses, I'm sorry, Moses cries out to the Lord and the Lord shows him a tree and says, throw the tree in the waters and he does and the waters are changed from bitter to sweet. What is that all about? I believe that's a picture of the cross. Why do I think that? Because the same word used for tree here is used for the cross in the New Testament. The same word used for tree here is used for the cross in the New Testament. And so the, the Lord was saying, 
I can take what is bitter and make it sweet. He wanted them to understand as you're wandering in the wilderness, as you're making your way through this life, through the, the, the hot, dusty paths of this life, you will experience bitterness. But if you will look to me and trust in me, I can take that bitterness and bring sweetness from it. And then for us, it's a foreshadowing of the cross of Christ. Amazing. And so we may apply the work of the cross and all that it means for us to the bitterness of life and the bitterness of sin, the bitterness is made sweet. The Lord is just beginning to teach the children of Israel how to walk with him. They've been slaves for hundreds of years up to this point. They haven't walked by faith. They've been told exactly what to do each and every day of their lives. And now there's this newfound sort of freedom. Now there's this newfound uh, way of life. But they need to learn to depend on the Lord. And we'll see that's what he's teaching them now as they enter into the wilderness. Look at verses, verse 25, the second part of verse 25 through 27. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. The Lord was establishing a statute there with them. All throughout the history of the Jews, there has been an interesting phenomenon that has surrounded them, not so much now, but but more so throughout the, the ancient history. And that is when disease, of, disease would come upon the land wherever they found themselves, they would often be spared or at least very lightly affected compared to the rest of the people around them. Even during the bubonic plagues, they were affected so lightly, the Jewish people, that those around them, their neighbors, seeing how, how lightly affected they were, began to think somehow it must be their fault because they weren't getting sick and dying in the same way that everyone else around them was. Why is that? Well, it's because the statutes and the ordinances and the commandments of God for them contained ritual washing, contained dietary restrictions, contained hygiene practices, uh, including so much more. But just by following the ways of the Lord, they didn't know why. They didn't understand why these things affected them the way that they did. But these were the things that God had given to them. And by following the statutes of God, they avoided much of the sickness and illness and problems of the people around them who did not. And so the Lord says, if if you will follow my statutes, my ordinances, my commandments, then you will avoid the diseases of the people around you. So it's not only a miraculous provision from God or a miraculous sustaining from God, but it's also just a practical sustaining from the Lord that we see. Now, those practices are are well known now, and so less of that takes place. But the reality is, is that the Lord is, as he says here, the healer. He says to them, I want you to know that I am the one who heals you. I am the one who heals you. If we will walk in the ways of the Lord, we will experience a healing. We will experience health. We will experience a prosperity that we certainly will not experience if we choose not to walk according to his ways. He knows how we, best will, how we will prosper best. He's created us. He's formed us. He is the architect of life. Don't you think the architect of life knows how we will prosper? That's what he's wanting them to understand, is that he knows what's good for his creation. 
After their lesson at Mara, we're told here they came to a place called Elim, a legitimate oasis with 12 springs and 70 palm trees. What a sight that must have been for them. You're, you're wandering through the wilderness. You get a, enough to drink from the, the bitter sp- spring that's made sweet. And then just a little ways further on the journey, and they come to maybe over the next sand dune or the next hill, and they find this amazing, true oasis. I find that, again, so interesting because I, I looked it up. On the map, it's about five miles further from Mara to Elim. The Lord could have just taken them directly there. Now, they were dying of thirst, some of them, it seems, so maybe they needed a short stop off to get something to wet their whistle a little bit before they could make it all the way to Elim, to the oasis. But, but what an interesting thing. Elim was just around the corner. And it's the same for you and me. As we walk through life, Hand in hand with the Lord, we are going to experience bitter moments. We are going to experience those, those hard, difficult times. But again, the Lord will, is able to make those things, even those things, sweet. As Romans 8, 28 promises, promises us that he works all things out for the good of those who love him that are called according to his purpose. As you walk with Christ, you look back over your life, even those bitter seasons... And we are able to say, man, the Lord brought sweetness out of that. Somehow, God brought sweetness out of that bitter season, that bitter moment in my life. But not only that, if you continue to walk with the Lord hand in hand, you'll find that oftentimes not, not too fur, far, uh, further, much further on your journey, there is an, an oasis, a, a time of rest. The Lord will bring us into a time of rest, a time of, of, of uh, refreshing for us. The Lord is training them. The Lord is teaching them. Look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 16. And they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. That's just the name. It doesn't have anything to do with, with the biblical idea of sin. Which is between Elim and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month. Now this is now just a month removed from Egypt for them. After they departed from the land of Egypt. And then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this assembly. With hunger. Now, we gave them a pass when they were dying of thirst. Because it was three days without water. It's in the desert. I understand. But this is getting kind of out of hand. This is the second time they've complained, saying, why didn't you just let us die in Egypt? You may remember if you were with us last week. I I actually, uh, I think the phrase that they use is actually kind of funny. They said to Moses when they when they were, were at the Red Sea and the, the Egyptian army is bearing down on them. Remember what they said to Moses in that moment? Were there not enough graves in Egypt for you to let us just die there? This is becoming a pattern for these people. I'm starting to wonder if they were just a bunch of whiners. I mean, this is one month. It's one month from seeing all of the plagues that God had poured out on the land of Egypt and then seeing God part the sea and them walking through on dry ground with the waters heaped up on either side and then the waters closing in on the Egyptian army. It's been one month since all of that had taken place. And they had just seen the bitter waters of Mara made sweet by a tree being put in the water. And here they are, they're a little bit hungry. Now this is different than the, than the thirst because we know they had livestock when they left Egypt. We know that they had provisions when they left Egypt. They were not starving in this moment. They may have just for the first time began to feel a little hunger. 
Maybe for the first time, their stomach growled a little bit. I think my stomach growled yesterday for the first time after Thanksgiving. (laughs) And they're complaining against Moses. Unbelievable. And, And let's be real. They say, you know, we had pots full of meat in Egypt and we had bread to the full. No, you didn't. You were slaves. You didn't have pots full of meat and ton, as much bread as you could possibly eat. They were in their minds reminiscing and making Egypt out to be something that it never was for them. It hadn't been that kind of experience for them in Egypt for hundreds of years. And yet they're, they're looking back and saying, oh, it was, it was better there. Why have you brought us out here to die and all of that? Now, I'm sure that you and I have, have never reacted in that kind of a way when things have gotten hard, right? You've never experienced the miraculous provision of God and then forgotten that and, and complained or fretted after, after the fact, right? You and I have never doubted that God was going to provide for us. You and I have never reminisced about the old days in Egypt, right? We've never done that kind of thing. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? I remember very clearly years ago, I'm reading through the book of Judges. And I'm reading this, this cycle of the Israelites. We're already seeing it here. The cycle has already begun <laughs> with the Israelites of God providing, God sustaining, God showing up, and then them going, oh, praise the Lord. Thank you, God. This is wonderful. And then they experience a little more hardship, and they go, oh, my gosh, we're going to perish. We're going to go down. It's, everything's falling apart. And then the Lord The Lord saves them. He provides for them. He meets them in that place. And they say, oh, thank you, Lord. This is great. Okay. And then a little ways down the road, things get hard again. They say, oh, my gosh, it's all going down. This is the cycle that we see. And I was reading through the book of Judges. And I remember thinking, what is wrong with these people? Why won't they just trust him? And the Holy Spirit said to me, sound familiar? And I realized in that moment, Unfortunately, yeah, it does sound familiar. And I realized in that moment, I believe that Israel is a picture of us. Israel, as you read through the Old Testament, Israel is a picture of humanity. It's you and me. It's every one of us. We're all guilty of these things. From time to time, we are all prone to, to kind of throwing up our hands and saying, I don't know what you're doing, Lord. It seems like you've forgotten about me after he's, he's met us time and time and time again. That's what we see here in his people. Well, what's the Lord going to do with them now that they're complaining against him? Look at verses four and five. Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. What does the Lord say? Does he say, I can't believe you people. What is wrong with you people? No, he says, I'll give them something to eat. I'll give them food. What a gracious God, right? What an amazing God. I mean, after all he had just done for them, They're just whining and complaining. And the Lord says, okay, I'll give them food. As a matter of fact, I'll give them food in a way that they have never even thought of. I'll give them a miraculous food. But it will require them to walk in dependence upon me. The way I'm going to provide this for them is going to require them to walk in dependence in a way that requires effort and obedience on their part. Look at verses six through eight. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, at evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. For he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? Also Moses said, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. 
See, the people thought they were complaining against Moses and Aaron. But Moses makes it really clear here. He says it three times. You're not complaining against us. You're complaining against the Lord. It's God that you're complaining about. And this is always the case. We may think we're complaining about our boss. We may think we're complaining about our spouse. We may think we're complaining about our kids or our health or our finances or a coworker or a neighbor or or whoever it is. We may think we're complaining about circumstances, but as a as a Christ follower, as one who's been redeemed by the Lord, and and I'm, I'm now his, and he is responsible for me. When I complain, who am I complaining against? The Lord. I'm murmuring against the Lord. When I complain about my country and the state of my nation, and I'm grumbling and murmuring at all these things, I'm complaining against the Lord. That's who I'm complaining against. See, grumbling and complaining are evidence of a lack of faith. Grumbling and complaining are a testimony that I do not trust my God, my provider. That's what grumbling and complaining are, a testimony that I don't trust that the Lord is is doing the right thing in my life or in my situation or in my circumstances or in my neighborhood or in my home. That's what it is. But contentment, on the other hand, is evidence of faith, an acknowledgement that all I'm experiencing and all I have is what the Lord has given to me and seen fit to bless me with. That's what contentment is. Choosing contentment in difficulty or in discomfort is an act of faith. Choosing contentment in difficulty or in discomfort is an act of faith. A faith that we don't see being displayed in the children of Israel at this point in time. How gracious is the Lord that instead of a a stern rebuke, instead of a a punishment, he says, I'm going to feed you. And Moses says, that's his glory. You're going to see his glory. The glory of the Lord is not, only, is not only defeating the enemies of Israel. It's not only showing his power and his might in defeating the enemy, but it's also in showing his mercy and his grace in feeding his people when they don't deserve it. Moses says, you're going you're gonna to see, you're going to know that the Lord is the one who's brought you out of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Shouldn't they already know that? Shouldn't they already know that the Lord is the one that brought them out of Egypt? Shouldn't you and I already know that the Lord is the one who has delivered us? That the Lord is the one who has saved us by his righteous right arm? Shouldn't you and I already know this? And yet we doubt. And the Lord doesn't rebuke us for that. The Lord is faithful to walk us through. The Lord is faithful to meet us right where we are. What an amazing thing. One thing we'll learn as you, as you read through the Old Testament and look at the children of Israel is that miracles do not produce faith. Miracles do not produce faith. They saw miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. They saw God's miraculous provision over and over and over again, and it didn't produce any faith in them whatsoever. The scriptures tell us, the New Testament tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is what produces faith in us. Getting into the word of God and getting the word of God into you is what produces faith, what grows us and builds us in our faith. We'll look at verses 9 through 12. Then Moses spoke to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. I don't know what that looked like, but I'm sure that got their attention. 
And the Lord spoke to Moses, and it seems to be, because the Lord is repeating himself here, it seems to be that he's speaking to Moses in the hearing of the whole congregation, that they can hear him. It, we're not, we can't say for sure. In verse 12, he says, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. I don't know about you, but if I had just been murmuring and complaining about the Lord and his provision, and then I see his glory in the cloud, and I hear his booming voice say this to me, I would feel rebuked. I would feel ashamed. I'm so sorry, Lord. I know that you are my God. And so it was, verse 13, that quail came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Now, as we'll see, the, the, the quail was not going to be an ongoing provision of the Lord. This was sort of a one-time blessing for them in this moment. But the manna was going to be his continual provision for them each and every morning, six days a week, from that point forward as they wandered in the wilderness. And I love that they, they, they referred to it as manna because manna literally means, what is it? When they saw this stuff on the ground, they said to one another, what is it? That's manna. They they said to one another, manna. And Moses said, that's your bread. That's what the Lord is providing for you. In Deuteronomy 8.3, the Lord says to Israel about this manna. It says, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Again, this was the Lord showing them how to depend on him and that he was their sustenance. He was their provision. His word was what they needed to live by. They thought they needed meat. They thought they needed bread. But their primary need was the Lord. And that's the same for you and me and for everybody that has breath on this planet. We think we have all these felt needs. The felt needs are the ones that that cry out the loudest. But the reality is our need is Him. Our need is His Word. Our need is to walk in relationship dependence with dependence upon him. That's the need. He was teaching them these things. Let's continue. Verses 16 through 18. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person. That was a generous amount. According to the number of persons, let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. For every man had gathered according to each one's need. Interesting. The Lord has established this principle for the gathering of the bread, the gathering of the the manna. And the principle was that every individual or every family had to gather for themselves. They, they, they weren't to establish some agency, right? It was, to, it was to gather all the manna for them and then bring it to the distribution center and that they go to it and receive or pay and receive their manna. No, every individual was responsible for themselves. And they were to go out and gather each and every morning, six days a week, resting on the seventh, as we'll see, and I find that interesting. The, those who were wealthier, 
We're not allowed to pay someone else to gather their manna for them. Each and every individual had to go out each and every day and gather their own manna. Why? Because this was representative of their dependence upon the Lord. You you can't get it through somebody else. You you can't pay for it. You can't, somebody else can't do the work for you and then give it to you. No, each and every one had to go out physically and gather themselves each day. And it's the same thing for you and for me. We must learn to walk in dependence upon the Lord each and every day. That's what we're called to. And as a matter of fact, we'll be told here in the next couple of, couple of verses that, that when the sun became hot, the manna melted. So what does that mean? That means you've got to get up early. That means you've got to get going before the sun gets hot and collect all of your manna each and every day. God was teaching them obedience. He was teaching them work ethic. He was teaching them personal responsibility. He was teaching them to depend upon him. It's almost like he knows what he's doing. And Jewish tradition says, this is interesting, because you think about this, it's that we're, we're told it's like coriander seed. It's like a little round substance on the ground. Jewish tradition says that when you swept it up, when you gathered it, the Lord miraculously kept separated it from the dirt so that you would only gather the seed because what they would have to do is mash it up and it became like a flower for them to use. And so you didn't have like flour mixed with dirt. That's what, according to Jewish tradition, because it'd be pretty interesting to be sweeping little seeds off the the ground of the desert, wouldn't it? And trying to sift dirt out of it? I don't know, maybe they did. God was teaching them. Verses 19 through 21, And Moses said, Let no one leave any of it till morning. I love this, verse 20, Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. But some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. So they gathered So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. <laughs> of course, even though it had been clearly communicated by the Lord that you can't keep some of it for the next day, they tried it anyway. They just decided they'd do it their way. Right? But it was very clearly communicated. You must gather every single day. You can't gather enough for the next day, except on the sixth day, you can gather enough for the next day. And yet, they tried it their own way anyway, didn't they? And what happened? It stunk. It bred worms and it stunk. It's exactly what happens when you and I try to do it our own way. The Lord has made it really clear. It's all pretty clear right here in the Word. And yet, our culture has just gotten further and further and further away from what God has said works and doesn't work. We just choose to go our own way. The Lord just made it really clear. You can only gather it one day. And they're like, ah, I mean, how serious is he about that? I I mean, what could happen? You know, as a matter of fact, if I gather twice as much today, I can sleep in tomorrow. I don't have to get up. I don't have to do the work tomorrow. This is going to be great. As a matter of fact, I'll just gather a ton of it on the first day of the week and just save it up and just eat that all all throughout the week. I'll just work one day a week. This will be great. And it bred worms and it stank. That's exactly what happens with our sin. We say, I know what you've said, Lord. You've said to wait until marriage. I know what you've said, Lord. You've said to, to honor my, my, my wife. I know what you've said, Lord. You've told me that I need to avoid these things and not be involved in those things. But I, I mean, what could happen? It'll breed worms and stink. That's what will happen. Sin brings death. Sin brings rot. Sin brings, brings stank. That's the reality. And so I love, it says, so they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. I hope that you've learned. I hope that I've learned. I hope that we, this is sunk into our thick skulls that sin is never worth it. It's never worth it. 
You can try it, but it's never worth it. And from time to time, I forget how it stinks, and I go back to it, and then I go, ooh, that stinks. And then I come back to the Lord, and I go, oh, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. And I, and I walk the Lord, and I, I do what I need to do before the Lord, and then I, I forget how bad sin stinks, and I go, hey, that seems like a pretty good idea. And I step over into sin again, and then I remember how bad it stinks, and it breeds worms, and I come back to the Lord. Hopefully, as we're growing in the Lord, that's happening less and less, right? At some point, hopefully, we start to realize, oh, sin just isn't worth it. It's not worth it. I'm just going to walk with the Lord. His ways are always better. And so it was, verse 22, on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning and Moses, as Moses commanded and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. I'll bet they were a little tentative that first time eating that stuff. And then Moses said, eat that today for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Interesting. Doesn't the Lord know us? Some of us try to gather it all on the first day so we don't have to work the rest of the week. Some of us are so, get so uh, caught up in work that we'll just work nonstop without a rest, without a break. Neither one is good. And so the Lord has created things in such a way, he's called us to, to live in such a way that there's balance and there's health for us. If you're a workaholic, you gotta, you gotta rest. You gotta build that into your life. The Lord modeled it for us in creation for six days. He created, he worked, and on the seventh day, he rested. And here he establishes the principle of the Sabbath. That guess what? You need rest. You need to rest. Working all the time is not good for you or your family or anyone else. You need rest. Not working is not good for you or your family or anyone else. You need to work. But there's a balance that's found in walking in obedience to the Lord. I love that. But look what happened. These are our last three verses, verse 27 through 30. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather. Really? But they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. <laughs> Are you starting to feel like I felt reading through the judges that, that time? Is this just going to be a continuous cycle? Is this just how it's going to be over and over and over again? Do we have to learn the hard way every single time? Or can we at some point just be wise enough to say, okay, I get it, Lord, you know what you're doing. Okay, I get it, Lord, your ways are the right ways. Your ways are the ways that will lead to prosperity. Your ways are the ways that will lead to health. Your ways are the ways that will lead to harmony. Your ways are the ways that will lead to joy. Your ways are the ways that will lead to peace. Your ways are the ways that will lead to hope, etc., etc., etc. He knows what he's doing. Now it's a process for all of us. And we're all at a different point in that process. Some of us have walked with the Lord for many, many years, for decades, and we're much further along than others. And some of us haven't even started the journey yet. But wherever you are, wherever I am, God will graciously and lovingly and mercifully take my hand, take your hand, and walk us through. 
And he will at times give us just incredible grace that, that don't, doesn't make any sense at all. And he will at times allow the worms and the stank to be experienced so that we will learn. But it's all God's grace. It's all God's love. Let's walk with him in obedience. Let's observe his statutes. Let's observe his commandments and experience the blessings that inevitably follow. Let's choose contentment as an act of faith to say, Lord, whatever it is that I have, whatever it is that you've allowed to come across my plate, to come, uh, to come into my life, I'm trusting that you know what's best for me. Amen? We're going to take communion together. The worship team is going to come up here in a, in a minute. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to take communion together. Let's, let's, let's meditate on the faithfulness of God in our lives. Let's remember the faithfulness of God in our lives to this point. As, we, as we're singing the next song and we're coming forward and taking communion, let's allow the Lord to speak to our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you are good in all that you do and all that you allow. Lord, we can't help, if we're honest, but see ourselves in your people, Israel, in this passage. It's me. I'm, I'm the one who receives miraculous provision and then complains and murmurs the next time that I feel lack. I'm the one, Lord, that you've given direction to and I choose to go against it and try my own way. I'm the one that is obstinate in trying to either get out of work or work too much. And you're the one who lovingly puts parameters around my life and leads me in the way of health and prosperity and life. We thank you, Lord, for your incredible faithfulness and for the glory, that is the, your glory that's revealed in your mercy and your grace toward us. Thank you, Jesus. Let's come, let's, let's stand and worship and come forward and receive communion during this next song.
seat. Just as the tree cleansed the bitter waters of Mara and made the water sweet, Jesus drank the bitter water of our sin in exchange for the sweetness of life with him. What an amazing thing. The scriptures tell us he drank the cup of God's wrath to the full. Even the dregs, the bottom of the cup, he took upon himself so that we might then experience new life, everlasting life. And so as we take the bread, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. Let's take the bread. And then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take the cup. Lord, we honor you and we praise you and we worship you with obedience for your shed blood that washes us white as snow. Amen. Let's stand and sing one last song to the Lord.
place today, God. I pray that you would make us as dependent on your body and blood as the Israelites were on the manna and the quail. God, remind us of who you are. Keep your, our minds on you during this season, we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Guys, have a great week. We'll see you back next week.